Welcome to my third part series on Azure Basics. In this particular series, I'll be talking about storage account. Now, since Udemy does not allow courses to be more than two hours, if you want to make it free, so that's the reason why I have divided it into multiple parts. So in this particular part, I'll be talking about storage accounts and all the services that are available in storage accounts, which includes the blob storage, the Azure files, the queues, and the tables. So I will be giving you detailed explanation about all these services as well as live demonstrations on how you can use these services. So I hope you have a good time and happy learning. OK, so now let's talk about storage account. Storage account is arguably the most important service in Azure after your compute service. And Azure storage account contains all of your Azure storage data objects, which includes blobs, file shares, queues, and tables. Now, the most important one here is the blob storage. Now, the blob storage includes things like files, images, etc., that you want to that you want stored in Azure. Now the storage account provides a unique namespace for your Azure storage data that can be accessible via HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, shown below is basically the endpoint for all the storage service and the corresponding endpoint. So for example, if you have blob storage, then the blob storage can be accessed via the corresponding endpoint. And similarly for the Azure file, the queue storage and the table storage. So now let's talk about the types of storage account you can create in Azure. Now this includes the standard general purpose V2, the premium blob, the premium file, and the premium page blobs. So if you're creating the standard general purpose version 2, you can create a blob, a queue, a table, and Azure file storage. And similarly, you get multiple redundancy options as well. Now these I will explain when we first create our storage account. Now apart from that, the other ones are premium, and these are used especially if you want low latency and if you want high performance. So let's start off by creating a first standard purpose V2. So I will see you in the next chapter. So let's create a first storage account. You can either search for storage account in your search bar, or if you've used it before, you'll find it in your main page as well. Or if you've not used it before, you can go to your all services and under storage, you can find your storage account. So let's open our storage account. So as you can see, I've already created three previous storage accounts. So let's create a new one. So I'll click on create. I need to give a resource group within which my storage account belongs. So I will use the storage resource group that's already cre created. If you want to create a new one, you can just click on this and create a new storage account. And here you need to give a unique name for your storage account name. Now this has to be unique across all the Azure domains. So it's mentioned here as well that the name must be unique across all existing storage account names in Azure. So let's just give it a unique name and let's put it in the East US region. And now here comes the performance. So the performance is divided into standard and premium. So as mentioned in the slides before, the standard is the standard general purpose. And the premium here includes the block, the file, and the page. So if I choose the premium here, then I have the option of selecting all these three. So the premium is something that I'll explain to you later. So let's choose the standard for this particular example. So now let's look at all the redundant options that we have. So we have four options, the local redundant service. So this provides you with just basic protection against service, against server rack and write failures. So this is recommended if you have a very non-critical scenario. Then there is the geo redundant service. Now this is useful if you have failure, if you want failure capabilities in a secondary region. Now it is recommended for backup scenarios. Then there is a zone redundant storage. So this is an option against data center failures. So this is recommended for high level, high availability scenarios. So what would happen here is that the data would be synchronously replicated across availability zones in a single region. So if one of the data center fails, then, then there would be a failover to the other availability zone within that particular region. And then there is the geo zone redundant service. So this would be the most expensive. So this includes all the functionality of the other two. So that is that it provides not only geo redundant, but it also provides zone redundant service. So the most expensive one would be the geo zone redundant and the least expensive one would be the local redundant storage. So let's choose this particular option. Let's click on review and create. And it's just running a validation and the validation has passed and let's click on create. Okay, so our resource has been created. So let's go to our particular resource. And here we have finally created our storage account. And because this is a version to general purpose, you have these options available to you. That is the container, the file share, the queue, and the table. So these options we will be discussing in the upcoming chapters. So I will see you in the next chapter where we'll discuss the first option, that is the container. So I'll see you there.
Okay, so now that you've created your storage account, the first thing that we'll do is we'll go to the containers and we'll create a new container. So let's just call this as my container. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll create a container. So you can just click on this and here you can give a name for your container. And here you need to mention what kind of access that you need your container to have. So you can either have it as private, you can have it as blob. So all the objects within this particular container will be read only. Or you can have a container, anonymous read access for both containers and blobs. So for, so for this particular example, let's just keep it as private and let's click on create. Okay, so once I've created this particular container, let's upload a few objects into it. So I will click on upload. And within this, let's upload a text file. So I will just upload this Firebase.json file. Okay, click on upload. And you can see that my particular file has been uploaded. So let's open this. And this is the URL to access this. Now, currently, because it's a private object, you can't directly access it. So if I copy this and if I paste it here, you can see that it gives a resource not found. So in the upcoming chapters, I'll explain to you how you can access your particular resource. Now, apart from that, the other changes that you can do is you can even edit the file directly. So I can go to the edit tab and I can make changes here and I can save it. And that's it for this chapter. I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now that we have an uploaded file here, let's talk about the change access level. So if I click on this, currently it's private. That means nobody, no anonymous person can access this particular file. So what we'll do is we'll make it blob and let's see what happens when we do that. So if I click on blob, I click on OK. And let's open this file again. And if I copy this URL, and if I paste it, you can see that I'm able to access this particular file. And now let's also talk about the third variety. So if I go back to my container again, and let's change the access level to container. So if I do this, I can also enumerate between all the contents of this particular container. So currently, this particular container has only one object. So what I need to do is I need to run this particular URL. And this URL gives me a list of all the items in this particular container. So if I run this currently, it will show me all the properties for this particular container. And if I go back to my previous setting, that is if I click on change again, and if I go back to blob, click on OK. And if I run the same URL again, it gives me an access denied. So that is the difference between your blob and your container. This particular container access makes it possible for you to enumerate all the contents of that particular container. So if I again go back to my previous setting, so if I again change this, click on OK, I'll run this again. And you can see that this particular URL works now. So this particular URL I will send in the description below. So you can just go through this. So the only thing that you need to change is that would, this would be the name of your storage account and this would be the name of your particular container. So this particular link I will send in the description below. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, now let's talk about access tire. In Azure, there are three access tires. There is the hot tire, the cold tire, and the archival tire. Now this, <clears throat> okay, so in up, okay, in this particular section, we'll talk about access tire. So in Azure, there are three access tires that are available, the hot tire, the cold tire, and the archival tire. Now, your data belongs to, <clears throat> so whenever you upload your data for the first time, it goes into the hot tire. Now, based on how much your data is, accessed or modified, you can place it in one of these three tires. That is, you can either let it be in the hot tire or you can either move it to cold tire or archival tire. You would want to move it to cold tire if that particular data is infrequently accessed or modified. And the data in the cold tire should be stored for a minimum of 30 days. The cold tire has a lower storage. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about access tires in Azure. So whenever you store your data in Azure, it is automatically moved to the hot tire. So a hot tire is basically optimized for storing data that is accessed or modified frequently. The hot tire has the highest storage cost, but the lowest access cost. And if your particular data is not frequently used or accessed, you can move it to the cool tire. Now the data 
In the cool tire, it should be stored for a minimum of 30 days. The cool tire has a lower storage cost and a higher access cost as compared to the hot tire. And finally, if your data is of the archival type, which will never be accessed or modified frequently at all, you can move it to the archival tire, which is basically an offline tire, which is optimized for storing data that is rarely accessed and that has flexible latency requirements on the order of hours. So if you try to access an archival tire, you will have to wait for a few hours for that to be online. So the data in the archival tire should be stored for a minimum of 180 days. So let's see how you can move your data from hot tire to cold or archival tire. So, so here I have an index.html type. So I can just click on this and here I can change this particular tire. I can either change it from hot to cold or I can change it to archive. So let's just change it to cold and let's click on save. And this particular data is currently of the access tire cool. Now similarly we can change this from cool to archival as well. So in our next chapter we'll talk about life cycle management where we can set up a rule so that it automatically updates a file's tire type from hot to cold or from cold to tire or from cold to archival based on that particular rule. So I will see you in the next chapter. So in our previous chapter we had seen access tire and how we manually moved the access tire of a particular object from hot to cool. Now this can be done in an automated fashion as well and it is recommended that you do it in an automated fashion. So to do that you can go to your data management and under data management you can see life cycle management. So here you can add a particular rule. So this is very straightforward and very easy to do. So you just need to give a name for your rule. So I just call this as blob rule. And this is applicable for all the blobs in your storage account. And you can have it just for the block or the append blobs. And again, the subtype can again be just the base blobs. You can have it either for snapshots as well as for version. So what we'll do is I click on next. And here you need to give the rule. So any base blob that was last modified. So here you need to mention the 10 number of days. So let's assume 10 days. Then what I uh, what I can do is I can either delete that particular blob, move it to cool or archival storage. So let's move it to cool storage and let's click on add. And that's it. You're done with your lifecycle management. So any blob that is more than that that was modified more than 10 days back would will automatically be shifted to the cool tire. So that's it for this particular lecture. This was a very simple lecture, and this particular lifecycle management should be used to reduce costs. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. So now let's talk about shared access signature credentials. So a shared access signature is a URL that grants specific rights to your particular storage resource. Now you can provide shared access signature to clients whom you do not trust with your storage account key, but whom you wish to delegate certain storage account resources. So let's see how we can use this shared access signature. So I'm in my storage account and if you keep hovering down, you can see under the security and networking, the shared access signature. Now this shared access signature is at three levels. The first one is at the account level. You can also have your shared access within your container. So if I open the container, so there is one at the container level and there is also one at the blob level. So if you open this particular file, you can also generate a sh shared access signature just for this particular file. So let's start by doing it at the most basic level that is at the blob level itself. So if you keep going down, all that you need to do here is you just need to click on generate SAS and URL and it generates a token for you. So it generates a token as well as a URL. So what, what you need to do is you can just copy this and let's just paste this particular URL. And you can see that you have access to this particular file using this particular URL and if you go back you can see that the access level for this is private. So it was using the SAS that you were able to access this particular file. So now let's also do it at the container level. So I am at my inside my container. If I click on my shared access token. So here because I'm at the container level now, I can have access to both container resources as well as blob resources. So what I will do is I will not only have read access, but I would also want to list all the blob objects within this particular container. To do that, I just need to click on this particular radio button and let's just generate our URL click on generate. So what I'll do first is I will just copy this and I will try to read this particular firebase.json but this time I will use the container security access to read this particular file. So let's do that.
So I will just copy the token that I generated. And here I need to specify the name of my file. So this is the name of my container. And the name of my file is firebase.json and a question mark. So let's see if I'm able to read this particular file. So you can see that I was able to read the file and this file was read using this particular container shared access token. So the next thing that I would want to do is I want to read all the blobs within this particular container. Now to do that, I need to add this particular variable to my particular URL. So let me just copy this. And if I add this, and again, I need to add an ampersand. And I also need to remove this particular. So this is at a container level and not at a file level. So let me remove this. And you can see that I get an XML as a response and it gives me all the blobs within my particular container. So this is how you can use your container level shared access token, not only to read your file, but also to get information about all other container related activities. Okay, so now that we've used the shared access signature for our container and blob, let's go to our main account. And what we'll do is we'll create a shared access signature for our complete account. So to do that, you can just click on your shared access signature here. And here it gives you all the service to which you can have access so it includes the blob the file the queue and the table so for the timing we'll just leave these three because we're not using it of course we'll come back to these when we talk up in depth about these three services as well and here you can specify whether you want your shared access signature to have access only to this particular service to a container within this particular service or to the object so what we'll do is we'll have all three so I tick on all three. Now, if I let's suppose if I do not select this, then I will not be able to read any of the blob objects, even if I generate the signature. So now let's suppose I do not tick mark this. And if I create a SAS and a connection string, I will not be able to read my blob object. So let's try that out. So what I'll do is I'll copy this and let's try to read the firebase.json file. And let me remove this. And I will paste my new signature. And you can see that this particular key was not able to read this particular object. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my shared access signature at the account level, and I'll tick mark on the object, and I'll generate another token. So I'll just copy this token again. And let's paste it now. And now you can see that I was able to read this particular file. Okay, so the next thing is I would want to list all the containers within my particular account. So to do that, let's go back to our URL again. So all that I need to do is I need to remove the container and the name of the file and I will just do a comp equal to list and ampersand. And this gives the list of all the containers that I have in my particular account. Now, apart from the listing and the reading, there are other tasks that you can perform as well using your token. So in the description below, I will give you a list of all the URLs that you can use to perform other tasks. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. So in our previous chapter, we had used the shared access signature to give access to our Azure storage account resources. In this particular chapter, we'll be using Azure access keys to do the same. So whenever you create a storage account, Azure generates two 512-bit storage account access keys. Now these keys can be used to authorize access to data in your storage account. Your storage account access keys are similar to your root password for your storage account, and they must be kept securely and safely at all times. You must never give your access keys to a third party or to somebody whom you do not trust. Now, if you want to give access, use the previous shared access signature method. So now let's talk about two ways in which you can use your access keys. The first way is the CLI. The CLI would generally be used by DevOps teams or other teams which create scripts which interacts with your Azure resources directly. Whereas the SDK would be used by programmers or developers who want to access their storage account. 
So let's go ahead and let's see how this works. So now before we proceed, let's talk about the Azure CLI. So the Azure command line interface is a set of commands used to create and manage Azure resources. The Azure CLI is available across Azure services and is, de and is designed to get you working quickly with Azure with the emphasis on automation. Now, if you talk to the DevOps team or any other team which is involved with automation in your company, you will understand that those people, they use the CLI to create resources. So if you are a beginner, to Azure, the easiest way for you to create your resource would be using the console. That is, you go to the console, you go to compute, you create your virtual machine. A much faster way of doing it would be using the Azure CLI. So there is an Azure CLI command to create a virtual machine. So for example, if you want to create a virtual machine, I generally search for that particular CLI command. I generally do a Google search. So for example, I'll do something like CLI create virtual machine in Azure. And I can just open this particular article. So this is basically a Microsoft article itself. And it will give you all the commands that you need to run to set up your, or to create your virtual machine. So that's how simple it is. And the installation is also quite straightforward. So based on which particular operating system you are using, you can install your Azure CLI. So now let's go back to our main console. So here, if I go back to my storage account, so this is the storage account that I have, and this contains the access keys over here. So if I open this, so these are the two 512 bit access keys that I had mentioned in my previous section, and you can just show these keys. And what I need to use is I need to use these particular keys with my CLI. So let me hide this. So the one more thing is if you do not want to install your command line interface in your local machine, you can always use the cloud shell. So the, so the cloud shell has CLI pre-installed in it. So let's open this. So once I open my cloud shell, I can just do an AZ. So this means that your CLI is present in your. So what we need to do now is we need to run two Azure CLI commands. The first one is the storage blob upload command. So in this particular command, what I need to give is the container name, the storage account name, and the access key, and the file that I want to upload. So this is the file that I want to upload into this particular container. And similarly, once I've uploaded it, I will download the same file as well. So for that, I will use the Azure storage blob download command. And again, I'll be using the access key over here to download the particular file. So let's first upload the particular file. So what I'll do is I'll create a file called text test.txt. So I'll create the file called test.txt and that will contain this particular text. So let's do that. So I'll do an ls and you can see that this particular file has been created. So let's go back to our command again. So here I need to mention the name of my container. So I will remove this. I'll go to containers. And this is the name of my container. So let me just copy this and paste it here. And similarly, the storage account name as well. So I'll just remove this. And this is the name of my storage account. So let me just copy this. I'll paste it here. And finally, the important access key. So let me remove this. What I need to do is I need to go to my access keys. I will just click on show keys, copy this, and I'll paste it here. So let's run this particular command. So I go back to my cloud shell again. I'll clear the screen and I'll paste this particular command. So let's run this. And you can see that it has finished uploading. So let's go back to my storage account. I go to my containers, my container, and you can see that this particular file has been uploaded. Now, similarly, let's download the same file as well. So I go back to my, and here, let me just replace the container name with the same. and the account key as well. And this is the account name, storage account name. I'll paste this. And let's run this particular command now. And let's do an LS. 
and you can see a file got downloaded and this is the same file that we had mentioned in our CLI command as well. So this is the same file. So, so our downloaded file will have this particular name. So let's just open that particular file to see the contents. And you can see that this has the same content as the file that we had downloaded. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had used our access keys with our CLI. Now you would use CLIs if you're into automation of, or if you're into DevOps. Now, if you're a programmer and if you want to code in a certain language and you want to access your particular storage account, then you can use certain SDKs that, it, that Azure provides you with. So let's see how we can use these SDKs along with our access keys. So here is a so here is a documentation on all the programming language. <clears throat> so here is a documentation of all the SDKs that are available. So currently it's available for .NET, Java, Python, JavaScript, Go, PHP, and Ruby. So let's use the JavaScript one and let's try to use the latest JavaScript SDK. So this is the reference document. So all that I need to do is I first need to create a directory and then I need to go to that directory, create a package.json file, install that package.json file and create a sample.js file. So let's quickly do this. And I'll be doing this in my cloud shell itself. I'll do an npm install. And you can see that the node modules are installed. So the next thing that I need to do is I need to copy the script. So this script has the Azure storage block dependency. Let me just copy this. So I'll create an index.js file. And once I've done that, let's go back to our, so what I need, okay, so the next thing I need to do is I need to ex export this variable with my connection string. So let's do that. So I'll just copy this variable name and let me exit out of this. And I go back to my container, go to my access keys, show key, and this is the connection string. So this basically contains this key as well. So I need to copy this and I need to paste it there. So this is basically the key that is included in this connection string as well. So let's save this. And once that is done, the next thing I can do is I can go to my code base. And so what we'll do is we'll just create a container. So to create a container, we can just copy this piece of code and let's paste it here. And let's run this particular piece of code. So let's do a node index.js. And you can see that this particular container got created. So let's go back to our storage account. Let's go to a container. And you can see that this particular container got created. 
So that is how you can use your JavaScript SDK along with your access key to perform various functions. So that's it for this particular chapter. So I will send you a link to this particular document in the description below. So what I have done currently is the create a container. You can do the other ones that is uploading a blog, listing the blog, downloading the blog, etc. So if you have any doubts with the other piece of code, you can always get in touch with me. Also, you can try it out for other languages as well. So I've tried it out for J JavaScript. There are SDKs available for other languages as well. For example, .NET, Java, Python, etc. So that's it for this chapter. I will see you in the next. So now let's talk about a very important concept called managed identity. Managed identity eliminates the needs for developers to manage credentials. Managed identity provides an identity for applications to use when connecting to resources that support Azure Active Directory authentication. So how does managed identity come into the picture with regards to Azure storage, which is basically the service that we are discussing. So this is how it works. So if you're using an Azure resource like a virtual machine, a function app, or any other compute resource, and this particular compute resource needs to access, let's assume an Azure storage or any other target. For example, you could it could even be an Azure Key Vault, an Azure SQL. Then all that you need to do is you need to link your compute resource to a managed identity. And this managed identity should be given permissions to access any of the target resources, for example, the Azure storage, the Azure SQL. And in this way, you eliminate the need for creating a separate access key or an SAS if you're using the Azure storage. So you do not need to worry about creating those access keys or tokens. All that you need to use is the managed identity. So this makes your life much simpler. So the only caveat here is that the source here must be an Azure resource or a resource that has connectivity to an Azure Active Directory. So let's go ahead and let's create an Azure virtual machine. And within that virtual machine, we'll create a managed identity. And that managed identity will be given access to an Azure storage account and we'll be able to access that Azure storage account directly within the virtual machine without having the need to create any extra credentials. So let's go ahead and let's do that. Okay, so let's start by creating our virtual machine. So I'll go to my virtual machine. Let me create a new virtual machine. So I'll click on create virtual machine. I'll put it in storage. Just call this as virtual machine. Password. And let me click on review and create. So I don't need to add anything extra. So I will just create this particular virtual machine. So everything seems fine. I'll click on create. Okay, so I've created my virtual machine. So what I need to do is I need to go to my identity here. And here I have the option of either creating a system assigned or a user assigned managed identity. So the difference between both are that your system assigned managed identity is just linked to your virtual machine. So whenever your virtual machine is deleted, your system assigned managed identity goes down as well. However, if you want to create your managed identity for multiple resources and you want to link them to those multiple resources, then you should go and create a user defined managed identity. So for this particular example, let's create a system assigned managed identity. So what I'll do is I'll switch this on, click on save. Yes. And this is the ID for my managed identity. So all that I need to do is I need to assign a few roles to my managed identity. So let's do that. I click on Azure role assignments. And let's click on add role assignments. So here the scope would be storage. And the resource would be my particular storage account. And I will assign it two roles. The first one is the owner role. I'll click on save. And I will similarly assign another role as well. So again, the scope is storage. And this is my storage account. And the other role that I will assign would be the storage blob data reader. So I need this particular role to read my particular data in my container. So I click on save. So once I've added these two roles, now I should be able to read data from that particular container. 
So now that I've added this particular rule, I have access to that particular storage account that I had previously created. So let's look at that storage account. So I go back to my storage account and this is the storage account to which I've given my virtual machine the access. So if I open this, I have a container and this particular container has this particular file. So our primary objective is to read this particular file. So let's do that. So what I'll do is I'll open my virtual machine. I'll use potty to do that. Let's get the IP address of the virtual machine. So this is the public IP. I'll just copy this. Okay. Yes. Okay, so now that you've logged into your virtual machine, the first thing that you need to do is you need to get the access token for your managed identity. Now to do that, you need to make use of your metadata service. So your metadata service is basically an IP address that provides you all relevant information about that virtual machine. So to do this, what you need to do is you need to use this particular URL and this particular URL will give you back the access token for your managed identity. So let me copy this. This particular link I will send in the description below. So you can just have a read of this particular article. So I will just paste this. And what I get here is the access token and I'll use this particular access token to read my particular file. So let me just copy this. And let me save this in a notepad. And once I've done that, I need to make use of this particular curl command to get access to my particular file. So what I'll do is I will just run the curl command and the file that I need to access is this particular file. So let me just open this and I will just get the URL for this file. So let me just copy this and similarly all the other the other header that I need to add is this and apart from the authorization bearer, which will contain my access token. So let me paste this as well. And okay, my URL is ready. So I can just copy this and I can paste it in my Okay, that seems to be something wrong. Okay, I've added the client ID as well. So let me just remove this. So this, so let me just copy this again, clear the screen. And you can see that I get this particular output. Now this is the output of that particular file. Now to verify that again, you can just go to your file and click on edit. And you can see that this is the content of that file. And this is the same content that you see here as well. So this is how you can actually read your particular file using your managed identity. So I hope this was a useful lecture. If you have any issues with this, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Now, this is a very important chapter because managed identity is something that you will always use whenever you're creating a virtual machine, not just to access your storage account, but also to access other services in Azure. So please make sure that you know a lot about your managed identity because like I said previously, it's a very important topic. So that's it for this particular topic. I will see you in the next. Okay, this is going to be a simple section on how to create a static website using your storage account. So you can open the storage account that you've created. Then under the data management, you can click on static website. And here you can enable your static website. And here you need to provide a path for your static website. So I'll provide an index.html as the path. And similarly, you can also provide an error.html as the error document path. So I'll click on save. So once you save this, there's a dollar web container that gets created. So if you keep going up, click on the containers and you can see a dollar web container gets created. So you can just open this and within this particular container, you need to add your index.html as well as your error.html. So let's create an index and an error.html. So I've created an index.html. It just has welcome. So I will save this and let's upload this particular file.
Okay, let's also upload an error.html file. So what I will do is I will just change this to page does not exist. And I'll save this as the error.html file. Okay, once that's done, let's upload the error.html file as well. Click on upload. Okay, that's the only thing we need to do. So we've done all the settings. So we go back to our static website again. And here you get the primary link to your website. So let's just copy this and let's paste it. And you can see that the index.html page is displayed. So let's try to put some other path which does not exist. So let's type in ABC. And you can see that it gets redirected. And you can see that it gets redirected to the error.html file. So that's how easy it is to create a static website in Azure. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now that we've created our static website, the next thing that we want to do is we need to create a custom domain so that that particular custom domain can redirect to this particular URL. So I already have a custom domain in GoDaddy. So I will be using that particular custom domain. So let's go there. So I'll be using this particular custom domain. So what I need to do is I need to go to the DNS of that particular custom domain. And then I need to add a C name. So what I'll do is I click on add here. A C name. And this has to be www and this has to point to this particular endpoint. So let me just copy this. And let's just paste it here. Click on save. So I need to remove this part and this part and I click on save. Okay, so once you've done that, the next thing that you need to do is you need to go to your networking, which is underneath your security and networking. So you can click on that. And you have to go to your custom domain. And then here you have to specify the same domain. So let me do that as well. And I'll click on save. Okay, so our custom domain has been set. So we need to wait for a few minutes for this to be up. So let's wait for that process to happen. So I will see you in a few minutes. And finally, after a few minutes, after you log into your custom domain, you can see this particular message. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, now let's talk about ways in which you can protect your storage account. The first and the simplest way is to lock your storage account. To do that, you can go to your storage account. And underneath your settings, you can find logs. So you can just click on this and you can add a log either at the storage account level or you can add it at the resource group or the subscription level. So let's add it at the storage account level itself. So I'll click on add. You just need to name, give a name for your log and let's make it for delete and not read only. And let's click on okay. Okay, so I've added my log so that Okay, so I've created my particular log. So let's see what happens if I try to delete a particular container within the storage account. So I go to my container. And let's suppose I want to delete this particular container. So if I try to delete this, and it shows here that this delete will fail if the delete logs are configured on this resource or the parent resource. So I click on OK. And it gives me an error. So this is one way in which you can protect your storage account. Now to remove this lock again, you have to go back to your logs again. I can delete this lock. And let's try to delete it again. So I go back to my containers. I'll click on this particular container and let's click on delete. I'll click on OK. And this time that particular container was deleted. So that is one way in which you can protect your containers from getting delete, deleted. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. So now let's talk about soft delete. So whenever you create a storage account, you have the option of having your soft delete enabled. So let's create another storage account. Click on storage account, create one. 
and let's create it in the storage resource group. I have to give a distinct name for my storage account, so I will just call this as 01. And let's go to the data protection tab. And here you can see that by default, the enable soft delete for blog is enabled, and so is the enable soft delete for container. So let's create a new storage account and let's see how this works. So let's click on review and create. And let's create this particular storage account. Okay, so I've created my storage account. So the first thing I'll do is I'll create a container. So let's create a container. I just call this as my container. Click on create. And within this container, let's store an object. So let's click on upload. I will just store this PNG, click on upload. And the first thing I'll do is I will delete this particular bucket. So if I do that, if I click on delete, click on OK. You can see that even though I have deleted this particular blob, I still can reference this blob. So to do that, I can just enable this show deleted blob. And you can see that I still have access to that previously deleted object. So what I can do is I can enable this again. So let's click on this again. And let's undelete this. I'll click on refresh. And if I go to my container, you can see that this particular object that I had previously deleted is active. If I go back to my data protection, so now this was only possible because I had enabled these two soft deletes for blob. So if I disable this, so let's say I untick this both at the blob level and the container level. So if I untick this as well, if I click on save, so now if I delete this particular blob or container, so there would be no backup created for this blob or for this container. So let's try to delete this again. So if I go back to my container, so this time what I'll do is I'll create, I will upload another image. So let's upload this particular image. I'll click on upload. Now, because I have disabled the soft delete, if I delete this, a backup of this would not be taken. So let's click on delete again, click on OK. And now let's click on show deleted blobs. So you can see that that particular deleted item is no longer available, even though I have enabled the show deleted blob. So that is how your soft delete works at the blob level. So let's try it at the container level as well. So now because I have disabled it, if I disable, if I delete this particular container, there would be no backup taken for this particular container. So if I enable this right now, you can see that there is no deleted container. So what we'll do is we'll again go back to our data protection. Let's enable the soft delete for container. Now this soft delete is just kept for seven days. So you can change this as well based on your requirements. So let's click on save. Let's go back to our container. And now if I delete this, a backup of this would be taken because I have enabled that soft delete. I click on delete, click on OK. Let me refresh this. And let's click on show deleted container. So you can see that this particular backup is taken. So if I go click on this container again, I can undelete this particular container. Let's click on undelete, click on save. Okay, I think I need to wait for some time. So now this particular container is active again. So let's again go back to our data, protect, data protection. Now this time I will disable this enable soft delete. I'll click on save again. And this time if I delete this particular container, a backup of that would not be taken. So let's delete it this time again. Click on OK. 
And now if I enable the show deleted container, it no longer exists because I have deleted that soft delete option. So that is how you can use your soft delete option to take backups of your deleted containers or blobs. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. So in this particular chapter, we'll talk about the concept of versioning for a particular blob object. So let's go to our data protection. And here, underneath tracking, you can enable versioning for a particular blob. So what this does is that you can use versioning to maintain previous versions of your blob for recovery and for restoration. So I have currently enabled this. So let's go to a container. So what I'll do is I'll create a new container. I'll just call this as version. Click on OK. And within this version, what I'll do is I will upload a certain HTML file. I will upload this index.html file. I'll click on OK and I'll upload this file. And let's view the particular file. So let's go to our edit. And if I click on edit here, you can see that this is how the file looks like. So the next thing that I'll do is I'll make a few changes to this particular file and I will re-upload the same index.html file. So let's open our index.html. I'll open it with notepad and I will just append it with a certain text. So I'll just call this as new and I will save this. And the next thing that I'll do is I'll upload the same file again. So I go back to my index.html, I'll click on OK. And then because this file already exists, I need to click on this overwrite if file exists and click on upload. And now if I open this index.html file, if I edit this, so you can see this particular change is here now. And now let's go back to our versions. And here you will see one extra entry added. And this particular version ID represents the index.html file that we had overwritten. So what we can do with this particular file is you can either download this, you can make this as the current version. If you wish, you can delete this or you can even generate an SAS for this. So what we'll do is we'll just download this initially. And if you download this, you can see that this particular file corresponds to the previous index.html file. And you can also make this as the current version. So if I click on make this as the current version, and let's go back to a index.html again. And if I click on edit now, you can see that it's reverted back to the previous index.html file. So that is how we can use versions for your particular file. So, th so this comes in handy, especially if you want to keep the previous versions of the file that you keep overwriting again and again. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so let's talk about all the redundancy options that are available in storage account. So let's create a storage account. So whenever you create a storage account, you have the option of choosing the redundancy that you want. And the options that are available for you are these four. So let's talk about them one by one. The first is the locally redundant storage. So whenever you create a locally redundant storage, three replicas of your data is created within the same data center. And one thing to note is that the data is synchronously replicated and the object has a durability of 11 nines. So now let's talk about the second kind of replication that is available. That is the zone redundant storage. So whenever you choose the zone redundant storage, your data is replicated across multiple availability zones within the same region. Now this gives the object durability of 12 nines. And again, the objects are synchronously replicated across all the availability zones. So this is a little more expensive than the previous one because the data is replicated across multiple availability zones. So now let's talk about the third kind of replication that is the geo-redundant storage. So whenever you choose the geo-redundant storage, there are two kinds of replication that happens. The, the first replication that happens is that your data is replicated three times within the same data center. So this is akin to your locally redundant storage. Now, once that happens, the second replication that happens is an asynchronous replication that happens within a secondary region. And within the secondary region, again, the data is copied, is replicated three times within the same data center. So this is the geo-redundant storage. Now this gives an object durability of 16 nines for a, for a given object for a an year. And finally, let's talk about the geo-zone redundant storage or the GZRS. So when you choose this, there are two kinds of replication that happens again. The first replication is that your data is replicated synchronously 
across multiple availability zones. So across three availability zones, as you see here. And once this replication happens, the second kind of rep replication that happens is that it asynchronously replicates data into a secondary region. And it replicates data three times within the same data center as shown here. Now this gives the same object durability as the previous one, that is 16 nines. So now based on your particular application, you need to choose one of these four. Now if your application is non-critical and does not require high availability, then you can choose the locally redundant storage. However, if your application is really criti data critical, then you should choose the GeoZone redundant storage. Now of course the pricing matters as well. The GeoZone redundant storage would be much more expensive than the locally redundant storage. Now the pricing for each of this I will send in the description below so you can have a look at that. So that's it for this chapter. I will see you in the next. Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll create a geo redundant storage. Now to do that, let's create a storage account. Let's click on storage account here. And let's put it in our storage resource group. And let's give a name for the storage resource. I'll just call this as geo. And here I have selected the geo redundant storage. So let's, so that's all I need to do. I'll click on review and create, and I will create the storage account. Okay, my storage account is created. So let's go to that particular resource. So here, if you keep going down, you will see something called a geo replication that's under data management. So you can just click on this. And here you can see that your primary data is currently in East US and your secondary data is in West US and the data is asynchronously replicated from your primary to secondary. And here you can view all your endpoints. So let's do one thing, let's create a container. I'll click on container, call this as my container. And I'll make this as anonymous, I'll click on create. And within this my container, let's upload a HTML page. And once that is done, let's just copy this and let's paste it here. And you can see that I'm able to access this index.html. Now let's go back to our geo replication. So let's view all the endpoints. So for the primary, this is the endpoint that we have. We also have an endpoint for our secondary endpoint. So for example, our secondary blob search service endpoint would be this. So I will just copy this and let's see if this particular data has been replicated in the secondary region. And you can see that within the secondary region as well that this particular index.html has been replicated. So this is how the replication happens. So this particular replication happens asynchronously. And if I click on this prepare for failover, there are a few things that will happen. And the most important thing that would happen is that the DNS, which is pointing to the East US would point to the West US region. And the second important thing that would happen is that this particular storage account, which is currently a geo redundant storage account will become a local storage account. And all the data would reside within the West US region. So let's click on prepare for failover and let's see whether these things happen. So let's click on prepare for failover. And a few things here to understand is that the last sync time is 60453 and the current time is 607. So any data change that has happened between 604 and 608 within the primary region will not be replicated in the secondary region. And another important thing, like I mentioned previously, is that the, your storage account replication will be converted into a locally redundant storage within the secondary region. And this particular locally redundant storage can again be converted into a geo redundant storage. So let's click on yes. And let's click on failover. So this takes a few minutes to happen. So let's wait for this process to complete. Okay, so my failover has finished. Now you can see that all my data resides within the West US. And let's click on all the endpoints and the endpoints remain the same. So I'll just copy this and I will just remove the secondary and let's try to access the index.html page. And you can see that I'm able to access this index.html page. And this particular URL is currently pointing to the West US region. And apart from that, the other thing that we need to see is that this particular 
storage account is currently a local redundant storage so it's no longer a geo redundant storage and if i go to my main overview you can see that the location even though is east us there is a new primary location that is added and this primary location is pointing to west us so and here again the replication that is mentioned here is that this is a locally redundant storage so it's no longer a geo redundant storage and one final thing to note is that this particular storage account can be converted again from a local redundant storage into a geo redundant storage again so that's it for this particular lecture i will see you in the next in this particular section we'll talk about object replication so object replication asynchronously copies blobs between a source storage account and a destination storage account so what are the uses of object replication so what are the main aims of using object replication the first main aim is minimizing latency so object replication can reduce latency for read requests by enabling clients to consume data from a region that is in close pro physical proximity it also increases efficiency for compute workloads with object replication compute workloads can process the same set of blocks in different regions it also helps in data distribution so you can process or analyze data in a single region and then replicate just the results to the additional regions and the final one is that it optimizes cost as well so after your data has been replicated you can reduce the cost by moving it to archival tier using the life cycle management policy so these are some of the main uses of using object replication so one thing here you can so one thing here to note is that object replication's main aim is not high availability or faster recovery its main aim is to basically minimize latency and to optimize your workload so let's see how object replication is done in azure in this particular lecture we'll talk about object replication so i have a storage account so what i will do is i will create another particular storage account in which my objects will be replicated so let me create another storage account So I will just call this as my storage account RE. And I will make this as local. Let's click on review and create. And let's create the storage account. Okay, let's go to that resource. So as you can see, I have created a storage account. So let's go and see. So let's refresh this. So as you can see, I have two storage accounts. So what I will do is I will go to my first storage account. And within the storage account, I have created a container called my container. So what I will do is I will make sure that I replicate all the contents of this particular container into my new storage account. So let's do that. So to do that, I need to go to my object replication. I need to set up a replication rule. So I'll click on this. So here I need to choose the destination storage account. So this is going to be the storage account that I've just created. So it's going to be my storage account RE. And I also need to select the source container. The source container is going to be my container. And the destination container is something that I need to create within my destination storage account. So let's do that. So I'm back in my destination storage account, my storage account RE. So what I'll do is I'll create a container here. I call this as my container as well. Click on create. And then let's go back to our old container. So let's refresh this again. So click on OK. Click up, click on setup replication rules. And let's choose my storage account RE as the destination. And let's choose the source container and the destination container. Again, the source container is my container. And the destination container is just the container that we've created in our destination storage account. So that will that will also be my container. And that's it. I just need to click on save and apply. Okay, so once I've saved it, what I'll do is I'll go back to my container within my source. So I go to my, my container and within this, I will upload an object. So let's click on upload. And let's upload a random PNG file. So I'll click on this, I'll click on open. And I'll upload this. And once I've done this asynchronously, that file should be. And once I've done this, this particular file should be asynchronously replicated in my destination source account as well. So it should be replicated within this container. So let's open this. And let's refresh this. So this takes a bit of time because it's done asynchronously. So let's wait for this replication to be done. 
And finally, after a few minutes, you can see that this particular file is also available in my destination storage account within the same container that we've created. So that is how you can replicate objects between a source and a destination container. And these containers are within different storage accounts. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, in this particular section, we'll talk about Azure File Share. Now, this is a service that is provided by the Azure storage account. So Azure File Share offers a fully managed file share in the cloud that is accessible via industry standards like SMB if you're using Windows or network file system if you're using Linux. Now, Azure File Share can be mounted concurrently by cloud or by a non privileged deployment. So some of the advantages of using file share includes shared access. So Azure File Share supports the standard SMB and NFS protocol, meaning that you can seamlessly replace your on-premise file share with the Azure File Share without having to worry about the application compatibility. It is also fully managed and can be created without the need of managing hardware or an operating system. So this means that you do not need to deal with patching the server OS with critical security upgrades or replacing faulty hard disks. Now there's also scripting and tooling available. So PowerShell commandlets and Azure CLI can be used to create, mount, and manage Azure File Share as part of the administration of the Azure application. You can create and manage Azure File Share using the Azure Portal and the Azure Storage Explorer. So we'll be using the Azure Portal to create our file share. There is also resiliency. So Azure File has been built from the ground to be always available. So replacing on-premise file share with Azure File means that you no longer have to wake up to deal with local power outage or network issues. Now there is also familiar programmability. So that means that the developers can therefore leverage their existing code and skills to migrate their existing application. In addition to system IO APIs, you can also use Azure storage client libraries or Azure storage REST APIs. So let's start by creating our first Azure file share. Okay, so I'm in my storage account right now. So let's create a first file share. So you can go to your file share here. And you can create a file share by clicking on this icon and you just need to give a name for your file share and it gives a maximum capacity of five terabytes and here there are three tires that is available to you so currently we just have the general purpose so this is disabled so all that we can choose is among these three so let's choose the transaction optimized and let's click on create And we have successfully created our file share. So let's log into our file share. And the first thing that we can do is we can upload a file. So let's click on upload and let's select any particular file. Let's select this particular PNG file and click on OK. And I'll click on oh, upload. And what we'll do in this particular section is we'll just try to access this particular file. So let's open this. And let's copy this and let's see if you're able to download this particular file. So if you try to download this file, it will give an error. So now this is because you have to use the shared access signature to download this particular file. So let's go to our shared access signature. And here what we'll do is we will just allow the file service. And let's allow this the service and the object. And let's create a shared access signature and a connection string. So once you've done that, let's copy the SAS token and let's paste it to the particular URL. And you can see that I was able to download this file. So let's open this file. So that's it for this particular section. Next section, we'll try to connect our file share to our Linux operating system. So I'll see you there. Okay, so now that you've created your file share, in this particular chapter, we'll try to connect it to a Linux operating system. So you can click on connect here, and you have the option of all three operating systems, that is Windows, Linux, and, and Mac OS. So in this particular section, let's try to connect it to a Linux OS. So I click on this and all that I need to do is I need to just copy this particular script and I need to paste it in my virtual machine. So I have copied this. Now let's go back to a virtual machine and let's paste this particular script there. Click on my virtual machine. So this is the IP address. Let me copy this and connect using putty. So once again, let's click on connect Linux and let's just copy this and let's just paste it here. 
And once that is done, let's go to our MNT folder. So I'll go to my MNT folder and let's do an LS here. And here you can see the file mount named file present over here as well. So let's go to CD file. And if I do an LS, you can see that this azure.png file is also available here. Now this is the same file that you see here. So let's try to do something else. So let's try to add a di directory here. So I click on this and I will just add a directory called folder. Click on OK. Let's refresh this. And if I go back to my file now in my operating system, if I do an LS, you can see that this particular folder is present over here and it can be accessed via the virtual machine. And similarly, if I create a folder here and if I go back to my file chat and if I refresh this, you can see that this particular folder is created here as well. And the other thing that is important to note is that you can connect multiple virtual machines to the same file share. So, so that is it for this particular lesson. I will see you in the next. Okay, so in this particular section, we'll talk about creating your snapshot for a file share. So I have created my file share here and it contains a few folders and files. So let's suppose that you are trying to create an application which would be accessing this particular file share and you're afraid that after your application has been deployed, some of these files or folders might get deleted. So in a situation like that, it's always best to create a snapshot before you deploy that particular application. So let's create a snapshot and let's see what happens. So I go to my snapshots and I just click on add snapshot and I click on OK. So the comment here is optional. So once you've created your snapshot, you can go back to your file system and let's suppose that you've deployed an application which caused this particular file to get deleted. So let's delete this particular file. Click on yes. And if you want to retrieve this file back, you can always go back to your latest snapshot, the one which you took before your deployment. And all that you need to do is this particular file would be available in that snapshot. So all that you need to do is you need to click on restore and you can give a name for your particular file. So let's just call it Azure deploy again, Azure temp.png again. And let's click on OK. OK, so once that is done, if you go back to a main file share, you can see that that particular file has been restored again. So this is one of the important functionalities of file share. In our next chapter, we'll talk about creating automatic backups, which is basically an automated way of creating snapshots. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, in this particular section, we'll talk about creating backups for your file share. Now to do that, you can go to your backup. And here, what you need to create is a recovery service vault. So you can either use an existing one or you can create a new one. So since I do not have an existing one, I will create a new one. And this will be the name of my particular vault. And then I can keep it in a particular resource group. So let's choose the storage resource group. And here is the important part of choosing the policy. So let's edit this particular policy and see how this policy looks like. So what this policy will do is it will take a backup at 7.30 p.m. UTC and then it will retain the backup for the last 30 days. So let's click on OK. And all that you need to do is you need to enable the backup and that will basically do it for you. So, so let's enable our backup. So let's click on enable backup and finally our automated backup is done. So let's go to our vault. And here, if you go to the vault, let's click on the backup items. And you can see that there is a backup item for our Azure stores, Azure files. So this was the last backup that was taken. So what we'll do is we'll try to restore it to this particular point. So before doing that, let's go back to a file. Let's do an overview. Let's delete this particular azure.png. So let's click on delete, click on yes. And now that we've deleted it, let's try to restore it from the back backup. So let's click on restore share. Let's select the last restore point. So I'll click on the last restore point. So there's currently just one restore point. So I'll click on OK. And the restore destination again should be the original location. Let's click on restore. And finally, if you go back to our file share again, you can see that this azure.png that I had deleted has been restored back. So it's basically restored it back to the state of the final backup that we had taken. 
So that's it for this particular lecture. I hope you understood the difference between taking a snapshot and taking a backup. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, in this particular section, we'll talk about Azure Queue Storage. Now, this is one of the other services that is provided by our storage account. So the Azure Queue Storage implements a cloud-based queue to enable communication between components of a distributed application. Now, each queue can maintain a list of messages that can be added by a sender component and processed by a receiver component. Now, with a queue, your application can scale immediately to meet the mass. Okay, so now let's assume that there are two applications. So one of the application will send the message to the Azure Queue service. And this particular message will be required by the application receiver to further process that particular message. So once the queue storage receives that message, it will store it and then it will further send it to the application receiver for further processing that particular message. So that's it for this particular lecture. In our next lecture, we'll see how we can create a queue storage in Azure. Okay, so I'm in my storage account. So let's create a fest queue. So to do that, you can go to your queues, which is under data storage. So you can click on queues and you can just create a new queue. So let's just call this as queue, my queue. Click on okay. And you've created your queue. So let's, okay, so now that you've created your queue, let's add a message to the queue. So let's click on add message. Now this is the process that the sender application would be doing. So we are just replicating it on the console itself. So let's just add a message here. Click on OK. And let's refresh this. And you can see that the message body is, hi, this is a message. And a few other things that you can do in your console is you can dequeue your message. So if you click on dequeue, it will say that you want to remove the first element in this particular queue. So let's say I click on yes. And it will remove that particular first element from the queue. So let's add a few more messages. So let's just call this as first message. Click on OK. Click on another. I'll just call this as second message. Click on OK. So now you can see that there are three messages in my queue. So let's see what happens if you dequeue this message again. So I'll click on dequeue, click on yes. And you can see that the first message from the queue was removed. And let's clear this particular queue. So to clear the queue, you can click on clear queue, click on yes. And all the messages from your queue will be deleted. So these are some of the functionalities you can perform in the console. So in our next chapter, we'll create a sample application and we'll see how we can use that sample application to make use of this particular queue. So I will see you there. Okay, so in this particular chapter, we'll create an application and this application will be divided into two halves. There'll be a sender and a receiver. So the job of the sender would be to send a, to create a queue. And once the queue is created, it will send a message to that particular queue that it has created. And the job of the receiver would be to receive that particular message that is sent to the queue. And once that is done, its job would be to delete that message from the queue. So let's see how we can create this particular application. To create this particular application, I'll be using this particular documentation. So this documentation gives you all the code snippets that is required to create your application. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go back to my cloud shell and I will create a folder and within that folder, I will create two separate applications. So let's do that. And within this, I will create two separate folders called as sender and receiver. So let's go to the sender folder first. And within this sender folder, the first thing I need to do is I need to create a package.json file and I need to install all the dependencies. So the main dependency here is basically the storage queue. And this queue will, and this particular SDK will let us create that particular queue. So let's copy this and let's paste it. I'll create a package.json file. And within that, I'll just paste the contents. So once I've done that, let's do an npm install. And 
And let's do an LS now. And you can see that my node modules has been created. So similarly, I'll do the same thing for the receiver as well. So let's go back to the receiver. I'll create a package of JSON file. And let's paste the same content. And let's do an npm install here as well. Okay, so that's done. So let's go back to our sender. So let's create a code now. So let's do a create a file called index.js. And within this index.js file, the first thing I need to do is I need to copy the boilerplate. So this is basically the boilerplate that I'll be using, and it's going to be within this particular boilerplate that I'll be copying my code snippet. So let's copy this and let's paste it within this index.js file. Okay, now that that is done, the next thing I need to do is I need to get the credentials or the access key and I need to store it in a variable called Azure Storage Connection String. And once that is done, I need to use that in my piece of code. So let's do that. So let's go back to my storage account. So I go to my access key, click on show key and this particular connection string I need to use. So let's copy this. Okay, so once that's copied, what I need to do is I need to export this particular variable with that particular value. So let's copy this particular content. And let's paste it. Okay, so that is done as well. So let's go back to a quick start. Okay, so now that we have your connection string, I need to get that connection string in my index.js. So to do that, I'll just copy this. And let's go back to our index.js file. Let's paste that variable at the top. Let's click on paste. So this particular variable is a part to my particular connection string that I just created. So once this is done, now comes the part where we need to add the code snippet. So let's go back to a quick start again. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create a queue. So to do that, I just need to copy this. And this particular piece of code, all that it does is it calls the Azure SDK and it creates a queue. So it first creates a queue client and this queue client uses the and this queue client uses the connection string and then you need to give a name for your queue. And the queue name that I have given is this. So you can choose any queue name that you like. So let's just let this particular queue name remain. So let's copy this code snippet and let's paste it within our main. So I'll paste it here. Okay, so once you've created your queue, the next thing that you need to do is you need to add a message to the queue. Now to do that, you can just copy this code snippet. And again, it's using the same SDK as well. And it'll create three messages within that queue. It will be the first message, the second message, and the third message. So let's paste that as well. So I'll click on paste. Okay, so this particular sender will do two things. It will create a queue and it will send these three messages into the queue. So let's let's run this index.js file so let's do an index node index dot dot js and it's creating the queue and this is the name of the queue and then it's added those three messages into the queue so let's see whether that has actually happened so i go back to my storage account i go to my queues i'll open my queue so you can see that this queue has been created and within this queue you can see there are three messages so we're done with our sender part so our sender has created this particular queue this is the name of the queue and we need this for our receiver. So let's copy this and let's paste it somewhere. And this particular queue has got three messages within it. So let's create our receiver now. So I go back to my, I clear this. I'll go to my receiver folder. And within this, let's again create an index.js file. And similar to the previous one, first thing we need to do is we need to copy the boilerplate. So let's copy this boilerplate and let's paste it. And let's paste it here. And after that, the next thing I need to do is
I need to get this variable in my code as well. So let's paste it here. Okay, so now that I have my access key within my code, let's get the snippet for receiving the message. So to receive the message, you need to copy this particular piece of code. Now, if you look at this piece of code, it is calling the queue client. So let's also get the queue client initialization code as well. So let's copy this first and let's paste it within our main. Now, as you can see that this particular piece of code or this particular code snippet also requires a queue client. So let's get that piece of line as well. So that line would be where we've created the queue. So this particular initialization has to be copied as well. And similarly, we also need to get the queue name. So let's copy this line. And let's paste it at the beginning. Paste it. And here we have this particular string. So this string is within this particular variable. And we also need to get the queue name. So let's hard code the queue name for the queue that we've created. So let's replace this. And let's replace it with this particular queue name. So this is the queue that was created by the sender. So let's copy this. And let's paste it here. So this particular piece of code is enough to receive our messages. So once we've received the message, the next thing we need to do is we need to delete it from the queue. So let's go and click on the snippet where we need to delete the message. So this is the snippet to delete the message from the queue. So all that I need to do here is I just need to copy this piece of code and I need to paste it here. Now these code, now these snippets of code are very straightforward. And if you have any issues with trying to decipher them, just do not hesitate to get in touch with me. So this is very basic code. So now let's go through the piece of code again. So the first thing we are doing is we are receiving the message here. So these four lines of code, this is enough to receive our message. And once the message has been received, we are going to delete each of these messages. To delete it again, we are, use, we are using the delete message function within the particular SDK. So let's close this particular file and let's run this particular application now. So it's receiving, receiving the message and it has deleted all the messages from that particular queue. So let's go back to our queue and let's try to refresh this. So when I refresh this, all the messages should be deleted. And you can see that all these messages have been deleted. So that is how you can use your sender and receiver to receive, create and delete the queue. So that's it for this particular lecture. If you have any issues with this, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. And I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll talk about the Azure Table Storage, which is one of the services that is provided by the storage account. Now, the Azure Table Storage is a service that stores non-relational structured data, also known as NoSQL data in the cloud, providing a key attribute store with a schemeless design. Now, because Table Storage is schemeless, it's easy to adapt your data as the needs of your application evolve. Now, access to storage data is fast and cost-effective for many types of application and it is typically lower than the cost of traditional SQL for a similar amount of volume. Now there is also Cosmos DB, which is another non-SQL database that is provided by Azure. So let's take a look at the difference between using Azure Table Storage and Azure Cosmos DB. Now this particular page shows the difference between using your Azure Table Storage and your Azure Cosmos DB. Now the important thing here is basically the latency. So even though Azure Table Storage is fast, but there is no upper bound on latency, whereas Cosmos Database has a upper bound on latency. So it is generally a single digit millisecond latency for reads and writes and backed with a less than 10 millisecond latency reads and less than 15 second millisecond latency writes at the 99th percentile at any scale anywhere in the world. So if your intention is to have low latency, then it's better to go for Azure Cosmos DB. Now the throughput is also another important factor to take into account. So, so the Azure Table Storage has a variable throughput model, whereas the Azure Cosmos DB has highly scalable dedicated reserved throughput per table that is backed by SLAs. And another important factor here is that the indexing for Azure Table Storage can only be done on the partition key and the row key. Whereas for Cosmos DB, the indexing can be done on all properties. So this is one important parameter that you need to consider. 
and the pricing is also for Azure Table Storage based on consumption, whereas for Cosmos DB it's based, so it can be based both on consumption or for provision capacity modes. Now the SLA is also another factor to take into account. So the SLA for Azure Table Storage is 99.99, whereas for Azure Cosmos DB it's 99.99 for a single region. And for multi-region with relaxed consistency, it's 99.999. So, so the finality is if your application needs to have low latency and higher throughput, then it's better to go for Azure Cosmos DB. Whereas for regular application, which does not need high latency or throughput, or even indexing just needs to be done on the partition and the row key, then you can go for the Azure Table Storage. So now let's look at how we can create an Azure Table Storage in the storage account. So in this particular chapter, we'll see how we can create a table in your storage account. So to do that, you can just go to your tables under data storage, click on the tables, and you can just click on this particular icon and you need to give a name for your table. So let's just call this as my table. Click on okay. And you have created your table. So let's add some data into this table. To do that, you can go to your storage explorer. You can click on your storage explorer. and just open this my table that you've created and you can just click on add and here you need to mention the partition key and the row key now one thing to note is only the partition key and the root row key are indexed so any other property that you add any other key value it will not be indexed so let's add a property for your partition key so let's add a value for your partition key so i'll just call this as task and the row key let's just give it the value one and let's add a property. So let's just call this as name. And let's click on insert. And similarly, you can keep adding more and more values. So another task, let's add the row key as two. And the name would be to Click on insert again. And this is how you can add data into your table. So let's click on query again. And here you can query for your particular data. So for example, if I want to query for all the values which has partition key equal to task. So let's just remove this and let's run this particular query. Or let's add a clause. So the clause that I would add is that I would want the row key equal to two. So it will just display the second row. So let's click on, and you can see that it just displayed the second row. And let's add a final name equal to clean room. And let's remove the, let's run this particular query. And similarly, you can see that the second row was outputted. So this is how you can run your query. So that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we can see how we can programmatically create a table and insert data into it. So I'll see you then.